More and more Americans who have passed the age of 65 are still punching the clock. We'll try to find out why in a moment. Also in this program, Pat Jacobs will be chatting with this week's young academic achiever, Javon Campbell, a grade 11 student at Packer Collegiate Institute, who not only excels in the classroom, but plays the clarinet, is a member of the band, and travels a lot. Well, I play the Hammond organ, but not in a band, well, not in the type of band that this student plays. 19% of Americans aged 65 and over are still working, according to recent government reports. That's the highest number of persons since 1962. Joining me to discuss this are Natasha Charles, a financial advisor, and Bertha Lewis, founder and president of the Black Institute and the Working Families Party. Well, Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. You know what my first question is going to be. Why are people over 65 still working? It's the economy, stupid. <laughs> it has always been the economy. Right now, AARP just put out a study that says, just here in New York, seniors over 50 plus going into their 60s, contribute over $600 billion a year to the New York economy. And yet, they cannot find what AARP calls livability. That is, affordable housing, um, affordable and good food, um, living in neighborhoods where their, their grandchildren may be able to go to school. Many of our 65 plusers are sort of like second term parents. They are raising the children of their children. So we have a brand new cycle, a brand new way of looking at folks who are 65 and older. And in fact, the 65 is almost now the new 55. And what we used to consider retirement age, either folks who cannot live on the Social Security or don't have a pension um, or any other means. And so with these added um, costs to their cost of living, they must work longer and longer and longer. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of seniors are not planning. Most people do not know how much they need for retirement. They have never thought about it. About 39% of seniors haven't even asked the question as to how much I would even need. So you have a problem not just with things getting more and more expensive and costly in the state of New York or across the country in general, but also the fact that people are not planning. The old age where you relied on your pension and Social Security to get you through the bucket is over. Most people do not have a pension and Social Security is questionable. Well, 65, they're going to get it, okay? But everybody's worried about what would happen to Social Security because you go to the website right now, by time 2035, they're saying they're going to run out of money. And for every dollar they promise, they only have 70 cents. So how are you going to feel secure about your retirement if there isn't enough money? Now, people never plan. You work 40 years of your life, 40 hours a week, and you end up with 40% of the income. How are you going to live here in New York? It's impossible. But let me ask you the obvious question for me, but may not be the obvious question to many, many people. Aren't you supposed to retire at 65? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a number. Retirement is really not an age number, but an income or money number. You can retire at any age if you have enough money to last you for the rest of your life. Younger than 65. Younger than 65. Okay, but what about over 65? I thought 65 was the cutoff, well, except for 
certain categories of workers? Well, 65 is what the government right. exactly. says. Exactly. Right. right. Social security. That's right. And they keep moving that 65, yeah. 67. Please wait until you're 70. Well, they keep talking about it, but yeah. it is a government construct. Yes. And in many ways, we are still living in almost an agrarian type society in which we have not upgraded our societal norms nor the safety nets. Um, even seniors that w would qualify for Medicare at hmm. 65, a lot of people are under the impression that once you get 65, and you, that Medicare is free uh. and that you almost have universal health care. That is not, it's not true. the case. And so she says there's a lot of educating to do. And you would have thought that more and more people talked about the baby boomers and those different classes of, of aging Americans. But let's also face it. There is a huge disparity between those that are working past 65 who are white and those that are working past 65 who are people of color. And those that comes because of yeah. education. It it's, may be education, I but I also think it's institutional. I it's do insti believe. It could be institutional, yes, but it's also educational because, because of the fact that we don't know. <laughs> Sometimes right? you don't know what you don't know. Yes, that's called being unconsciously incompetent. You don't know that you don't know. Because you don't know, you never get to the point of really figuring out how much do I need? Is this job really worth it? You know, many people cannot afford to keep their jobs, and they don't know. They work 40 years, I'm doing the thing that I'm supposed to do, but guess what? That's not the thing. I have a young, right today, I had a client come to me. She's 28, right? She's a social worker, $81,000 in student loan debt, makes $53,000 a year. You know where she lives? At home with mom. You know why? Because of student loans, car payments, she cannot afford an apartment in New York, and she's now thinking, wait a minute, this job is not the job I should have had because it will never get me to where I need to be. Natasha, I wanted to ask you, well, let me correct myself first. <laughs> Esther is your professional name. Yes. And Natasha is for those who've known me for a very, very, very long time. So it obviously is not for me because I don't know you <laughs> no. for a long, long time. So let me stick with the Esther. That, that Either one, whichever one makes you more comfortable. Well, let me, let me call you the name that people know you by. Right. Esther. Yes. And I was about to ask, how do you change that construct? It comes down to really sitting with an advisor and getting an analysis done to figure out what do you need. That's what you mean by education? Yes. Okay, go well, on. Well, education, most people think of a financial advisor, oh, when I have money. Oh, when I get this amount of money, I need an advisor. No, you need the advisor when you're broke, <laughs> when you have no money, so that you can figure out what it is that you need, so you have a goal to and know where you're going. If but you can those people afford you? Can those people afford advisors? Ah, not all advisors charge you money up front. Now, if you go to the typical, and you look surprised. Yes. Okay. Everyone I sit with, complimentary. I never charge anyone for sitting with me. I never charge anyone for doing an analysis with me. Hmm. Right? Because the average American, the average person, if you're going to spend $3,000 for a financial advisor or $3,000 on a vacation, what would you do? They take the vacation. They'll take the vacation, mm -hmm. hands down. So I never charge. I sit with them, educate them, show them what they need, put a plan together. Now, the company that they choose to implement those plans with are the companies that pay me. So I never charge my clients, never. Well, I take a little different tact mm. because I do think, you know, people should avail themselves of financial advisors. As for me, I'm an organizer. I'm an advocate. And 
I look at systemic problems mm. and, and educating our, our children, our young people, our workers. For instance, if you are a female who has over the years been systematically underpaid oh. and not get, gotten the same pay as a male, when we come to that cash of money, either in your pension or in Social Security, you already start at a disadvantage. The crushing, the crushing student debt, in many instances, the folks that owe the student debt, the students, former students, mm. cannot pay, mm -hmm. and the burden falls on their parents. Um, and the burden falls on them with credit card debt and other. Again, you have young people living with their with parents. Their parents yes. So there's more toilet paper, there's more <laughs> food, there's more of everything. So I would suggest this. It may be a radical notion, but the one thing that we have to take advantage of is our education system. You must be able to start young people very early teaching um, financial management and how to make a plan Absolutely. in your math class Absolutely. so that it becomes a part Absolutely. of you. And we, as people of color, need to be able to incorporate them in our culture because we, in this country, have not been culturized to even think about anything other than paying bills, uh, paying bills or being workers, not even thinking about having our but own How do you business. make those changes to the educational system? You change the curriculum. The <laughs> curriculum has to be changed. I mean, right now, there are only about three or four states in the entire United States that have a class on financial education mandated. Mm -hmm. now, and definitely it's not New York, Connecticut, or That's New right. Jersey. That's mm -hmm. right. Now, Some of the most expensive places. Some of the most exp expensive mm -hmm. places to live. Now, I started that change personally with my daughter because if you speak to her, she knows about savings. She knows about investments. She knows about um, anything that you need to know about finance. But that comes down from the fact that I am a financial advisor. I didn't get exactly. that education mm -hmm. myself coming up. As a person of color, we barely talked about money. Much, we only, only heard about bills. Never heard about savings, investments. Those types of things were not discussed. In, it was kind of taboo. You don't ask somebody, how much do you make? Where do you save? What do you, that's not a conversation that you have. Even today, it's difficult to have those conversations with people. They're very closed about it. Going back to my question. How do you make those adjustments to the educational system? Do you, do you put pressure as a working families party? Do, do you, you have to do you that? Have to you have to everywhere. You Every have to do that. Where? The other, you know, we constantly talk about parental involvement. Mm. And your daughter is extremely lucky um, because finance is at the bottom of everything. So, for instance, um, putting this mandatory passing legislation in which financial education is mandatory um, in this state as it is in, in other states. Also raising wages, also fighting against making sure that we do not privatize Social Security and take a risk. Mm. It is a huge task, but here is why I am very hopeful and optimistic. This population is aging. Mm -hmm. It is aging, aging, aging. And because of the ch shift in demographics, if we do not take drastic action by either on the job workers getting financial education from their employers, in changing their curriculum, bringing in people like Esther, that come in and teach in after school programs or work with teachers to incorporate say, it in the curriculum. I'm, and people like me fight for the legislation to make it mandatory. I have been to churches, schools, civic groups giving free 
financial education workshops. When I go to the schools, this is what happens. They say, yes, of course, you can come in. But they only bring the top students, mm. the AP students, are the only ones who are in, in this class. It defeats the purpose. It defeats the purpose because those AP students, they all want to be doctors, lawyers, you know, uh, politicians, whatever. They're looking for that higher income. The other set of people, the rest of the school, no one talks about them. They're the one that's having the problem because the issue is that out of every hundred people, there are only five that are financially independent. <laughs> the other 95% are financially clueless. So to change that, we have to change the education system. But let's get back school. to the responsibility of the employer, as you were talking about. Mm -hmm. oh. the, the employer is not going to consider that important because, as we were saying earlier today, uh, the employer is able to, char to pay these over 65s a lot less than they would pay other persons. Well, you have two things happening. For employers where the employee has been there for a long time, the employers really, they're not interested in helping them per se. Gone are the days where the pensions was the thing. Right now you have the 401k and that was instituted primarily for high level executives to shield their income. But when the companies realized, hey, I could have my my worker get into this 401k and I don't have to contribute or if you if you notice now most employers do not match the employee's contribution so the employee is putting in money into this plan and the employer is not matching at all or if ever maybe two hundred dollars or two percent or something very menial so the, the that employee is 100% at risk in the market because that 401k has the ability to become a 201k hmm. as it did in 2008. But as Esther said, we have a two-tier problem. Mm -hmm. Changing the education system so that we start earlier and mandating that employers have some sort of financial education, especially those who don't do a pension, especially those who hire she, Esther said, she'll go anywhere. Yes. She'll go anywhere, anytime, and speak to anyone. So we could make this a win-win situation mm -hmm. with employers that already are employing over 65ers. And the over 65ers, if you notice, once people retire, they quickly figure out they don't have enough money. <laughs> right? Very quickly. Within a year or two, they're either back to work, and you, you try to look at where are they working. Walmart, McDonald's, Wendy's, Staples. Why? Because they come to work on time. They're punctual. They're responsible. The younger workers are not as responsible and not definitely not punctual. So mm. what you're finding is that these employers are hiring that older population and they're taking those jobs because they can't find anything else. We have this growing number of you call them baby boomers. Mm -hmm. What about the young people? What does that, what, what position does that place young people in, in their efforts to get into the job market? Difficult, very difficult, because the older folks are not retiring. They're, they're realizing that, wait a minute, I cannot afford to retire. So most people I talk to, and funny, most of my clients are over 55. So they're saying, I'll, oh, I'm never retiring. I'll work till I die or maybe a past 70. They're not thinking about retiring because they're realizing it's next to impossible. So a lot of our younger college graduates, uh, master's degrees are home in their parents' basements because frankly their parents are not retiring. Hmm. But it also sets up a societal and cultural schism mm. um, between uh, youth and our elders. There needs to be real uh, cooperation and a real partnership. And we all are in a capitalist society, but the thing is what we have to do 
is to say we are not going to be pitted against each other where you have young people that can't find entry level because grandpa and grandma are working there. So for me, these radical notions of mandatory financial help as well as school curriculum mm. but so that we are teaching the young people, we must avoid an ageism schism. So we are entering a drastic period of change yes. in our country. Yes. There's, only, there's one other thing I want to add. We find a lot of corporate, large corporate companies right now, they're actually firing the older yes. generation because they're too expensive and they'll hire two young person at, for the same salary. So I've known people at, well, I'm not going to name the companies, but have laid off. I said, we can't hire you, but you can reapply. And when you reapply, it's for half the salary. But you just no said, benefits. But you just said that they're hiring older people. It depends on the, on, on on the, the industry. Well, in your low-wage okay, okay. low low jobs. In your yeah. low-wage right. job. Gotcha. The high-wage yes. jobs are getting rid of them and hiring the younger folks or hiring them back at half the salary. So you have two problems on either end of the spectrum. I want to thank you. Bertha Lewis, it's good to see you again. Good to be seen. And uh, Natasha, I know I should not be calling you Natasha, <laughs> your, your, your professional name, the, the Bible name that I have to remember. Yes, Esther. Esther. Esther Charles. Yes, thank you for, very much for being on our program. And uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you, Sam. With me is Jevon Campbell, yes. an 11th grade student at Packer Collegiate Institute. Jevon, welcome to the program. Thank you. You're here because we regard you as a high achiever. You know what? I think that's an understatement. I think you're a prodigy. You have been doing well from pre-K. You were in the SOAR program. You went prep for prep. You got scholarship to high school. How are you doing now? I'm doing very well. Explain. You're doing some courses that are equivalent to AP courses? Yes. At my school, we do advanced topic courses instead of advanced placement courses. So I'm taking three of those courses right now. I take AT English, AT History, and AT math. And what is your grade point average like? My GPA right now is 3.71. And you have one of the highest scores in the school? Or the highest? I believe so. I mean, when I read your bio, I was very impressed. In grade four, grades four and five, you earned perfect score in this state examination. Yes, in math. That's unbelievable. No, I mean, for somebody who is doing so well, you must know why or you can't figure out why you're doing so well what would you say are some of the contributing factors i would definitely say the main factor is my mom she pushes me every day to do my best and she accepts nothing less than excellence and i really strive to make her happy and to do my best and also for myself i think i also push myself because i was just going to ask if you're doing it only for her then you feel as if you know she's just pulling you pulling you pulling you but you really have that innate desire to achieve yes i truly believe she's trying to get the best out of me and i think i can really do great things with that extra encouragement and help and i really have high standards for myself okay now when i look at your your cv i really just think that you have no time to do anything else and then I realized that you are an outstanding musician. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I play three instruments at the moment. Three? Yes, three. Okay. Um, in terms of performing, so... What are the instruments? I play alto saxophone, soprano saxophone, and clarinet. And um, for alto saxophone... And how old are you? I'm, in, I'm 17 right now. Wow. And then you're in uh, the bands? Yes, so in school, I'm in a few bands and outside of school. A few bands? Yes. Three bands are here? Yes. Three bands in school and then other bands outside of school? Yes. So a total of how many bands do you play with? Five right now. Wow. And um, I think I heard that you performed at Lincoln Center? Yes. How come? 
I did that in middle school, a part of their Brooklyn Division Middle School Jazz Academy. And um, that was actually my first exposure to jazz music. So it was um, really fun. They also even let us go to some concerts for free. And we even played at Lincoln Center a few times. So one of the bands is a jazz band? Yes. And the other bands are what? Um, so for in school, I do clarinet with the Wind Symphony. And that's mainly like a concert band. But then I'm in part of the jazz band and I play alto saxophone in that. And I play soprano saxophone in the jazz combo, which is a smaller group that does a lot more improvising. And then outside of school, I play Afro-Latin jazz with the fat Afro-Latin jazz cats. And so, so you're really exposed to a wide cross-section of genres? Yes, definitely. So, okay, so tell me now, tell me the truth. You do absolutely nothing else. No, I also um, do community service. So I also play in church and I also take part in community service with the Lions Club, the Metropolis um, Lions Club of Brooklyn. So I heard that you, you went to Italy recently? Yes. Because you, at school you, do, uh, you have a Latin class? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. So at school I take Latin as my language class. And um, recently during spring break we went to Italy for nine days. And we really got to explore the city and see the different sites. And it was just amazing to see how Latin was ingrained in the culture. You could see it in graffiti. You could see it in the churches. And it was um, a very prominent part of their culture. All right. To wrap up this interview, what's next for Javon? Well, I plan to have a very strong end to my junior year. I plan to do well on my SAT subject tests. And I also plan to start preparing for colleges and try to get into one of the top colleges in the and country. And you want to pursue? A medicine. Great. Well, it was a pleasure having you um, on our program and we, I am absolutely sure that we are going to hear much, much more about you. I'm convinced you do not sleep, so I am going to let you get offset so you can get some sleep. Over to you, Sam. Go to our Facebook page and message us or email us at info dot brooklyn45.com that's info at brooklyn45.com on behalf of our entire brooklyn45 production team thank you for watching brooklyn45